This morning, we are, as we continue our trek through the Bible, we've arrived at the book of 1 Timothy. All right, 1 Timothy. So open your Bibles to the book of 1 Timothy. This is an exciting book of the Bible. One of the first, one of the three letters that fall together, these are the pastoral epistles, they're called. Pastoral epistles. That would be 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. Why do they call them the pastoral epistles? Because there is much instruction in here for pastors and elders in the church. But that's not all that's in here. What I want to do this morning is I want to direct your attention to the 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14, because this is, will help us to understand why Paul wrote this letter written by the Apostle Paul. Let me read this to you, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, so we can get an understanding of what we're doing this morning. It says this, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter to Timothy. It's specifically written to him, it says, in chapter 1, verse 2. But, of course, we know that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped, complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. But here's why he wrote this. So the church would know how they are to conduct themselves as the church. Not just the building, the people. So we know that this is the theme, a key theme in this letter, is how the church, how the church may conduct themselves. So as we look at the book of 1 Timothy, let's look at it in that light. And this morning we're going to, I'll just give you the title of the message before we stand together and read these first 11 verses. But the title of the message this morning is Considering the Call of God. Considering the call of God. Let's stand together, and I'll read the first 11 verses. You can follow along in your Bibles. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ our hope, to Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers. And if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Lord, teach us. Reveal yourself to us through your word today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may have a seat. So as we consider the call of God, Three points this morning, and I'll give them to you. The call of God is by the commandment of God, point number one. The call of God can be a specific call. And then we have point number three is the purpose of the call. The call of God is the commandment of God, is by the commandment of God. The call of God is specific, and there is a purpose for the call of God. Now, as we look at this, we see first and foremost that it's written by the Apostle Paul. It says that right there, Paul, 
an apostle. That word means one who was sent with a message, the word apostle. He is sent with a message. Now, but what I want us to see here, the first thing I want us to see is that Paul had a specific call on his life in the body of Christ. <clears throat> he was called to be an apostle. And look what it says, by the commandment of God. Now, this idea of a call on your life, yes, that, that's exactly, we. each one of us, humans, little Wyatt, at his age, doesn't have a clue about this at this point in his life, but he has a call on his life. And um, it's up. And we prayed over his parents and or in his family today, and, and over the congregation that we would be used by God somehow to help him fulfill that call that he has for his life. Now, obviously, most of that will fall on his parents. Um, actually, I take that back. Most of it's going to fall on God, but his parents are going to be secondary in that, and very important. The rest of us, just a very peripheral view or help in that idea, but it is nevertheless the idea that as we pray over him this morning, just acknowledging that this little one has a call on his life, and the hope is that when he stands before God at the end of his life, as the Bible says to be absent from the body, present with the Lord as a Christian, but to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. That's going to be music to your ears. That should be the thing that you desire to hear from the Lord Jesus Christ. The question is, how do we hear that? Well, you answer the call of God. Most of you have telephones. Most of you, when the phone rings, most of you answer the call, right? And things have gotten, te you don't have to answer the call, but you know what I mean. The phone rings, you answer the call. Same concept with the Lord. When the phone rings, we answer the call. I'm talking about the call to be a Christian, first of all. God knocking, you can, maybe some of you can remember when that was taking place in your life. The call of God in your life. But you must answer that call. You must respond to the call, the, the call of God that's coming. You have a call, and each one of us has that. Now, the first way that answer, you would answer would be to be, become a Christian. The Holy Spirit comes alongside you when you're absent from Christ, and he shows you that you're a sinner and that you have a sin problem, and Jesus is the answer for that. And so he calls people into his kingdom. But more than that, when he calls you into his kingdom, he gives you a specific job, calling, gifting in the body of Christ. You know, how do you conduct yourself in the church? The church conducts itself as each one is called we are like, likened to, in Corinthians, it talks this idea about we are like a, the body of Christ. The body is the same way. Each one of us have a function in the body of Christ. Find your function in the body of Christ. You, you've been called, um, and you need to find your function. I talked about this, was it last week? Um, this idea of um, each one of us are a part. We're, we're not, you matter. And I'm not just saying we love you. I'm saying you matter in this whole operation of what's called the church. You're a, you're a part of it. And when you're not here, you are absent. Um, when you're absent from the body, so to speak, you know, absent from being at church, it matters. And I, I use the illustration that when I'm not, when I'm absent from the body, I have to get somebody to fill in for me. Right? I just can't not show up for church. Um, I'm not suggesting that I never that never enters my mind. Um, I remember the pastor um, who was getting ready for church, and he tells his wife, "I'm not going to church today." This is the pastor. I'm not going to church today, and, and she goes, "You can't do that. You're, you're oh, I messed that whole joke up. <laughs> I'm getting old. People, pray for me. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. You're right. You, you've heard that joke before here." I told the punchline. Dang on. Forget that. Erase the tape. Anyway, it wasn't that funny anyway, really. But um, the idea that the guy, he was telling his wife, he wasn't supposed to, you weren't supposed to know it was the pastor. Okay, that was the part I told. I'm not going to church today. 
I'm going to finish anyway. I'm not going to pretend you don't know that part. I'm not going to church today. Why, why aren't you going to church today? I'm not going. And he goes, just give, me, just give me three good reasons why I should go to church today. Those people hate me. They hate me there. And uh, the wife says, well, number one, everybody doesn't hate you there. And number two, you, you need to be there. Number three, you're the pastor. You get it, Melanie? See? I messed that totally up. Thanks for laughing. That was cute. Anyway, um, so when I'm not here, I have to get somebody to fill in for me. What about when you're not here? What do you do? Do you even give it a second thought? Oh, they won't miss me. Or, you know, what's the big deal? The, thing, the show goes on without me, if you want to call it that, right? The truth of the matter is, when you're not here, the body of Christ isn't the same. I don't know if you believe that or not, but it's true. It really is true. Some of you will hear me say, and I mean this, I missed you. When you're not here, you are missed. Of course, it's funny, whenever the pastor says this, this is what happens. When I say, we missed, I missed you, and they start telling me why they weren't in church. It's like, you know, well, I was doing this, and I was doing that, and I feel... Part of me feels bad. They're missing the point of what I'm saying. I'm not asking you to explain why you weren't in church. That's not what I'm saying that for. I merely was explaining to you that I missed you. You know what I'm saying? Can we say that without, of course, when it comes from the pastor, I, I can understand why you would feel like you have to explain that. But so instead of me having to do it, you start doing it, okay? Just, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you already do that, right? Do they do that to you too? Do they start explaining why they weren't here? But anyway, um, but we all have a call in our lives a call to fulfill. Now, we're, we're not apostles, but Paul was an apostle. And here's what I want to say to you about this call of God on your life. It's by the commandment of God. That means that it's what it is. When I prayed over Wyatt this morning, it's a specific call for him. Now, God's calling him to be a Christian as soon as he is able. When he starts to understand, the, when he can understand the gospel, God's calling him to be a Christian, but God also made him for a purpose. He's got a specific, tailor-made plan for that young man. And isn't that, maybe some of you can remember when God revealed that to you. I remember, and this is, a, it's an amazing thing. It's a God thing. 1976, for me, when I, I, I was... God had revealed himself to me. He became real to me. I went from being a Catholic to an to a atheist. In my mind, I was saying there was no God. But my friends that I was, chose to hang around with, that's, that was the word. They were, that's what they were saying. I'm going, that sounds good. Somebody told me, they just tell you that there's a God so you'll behave yourself. And I thought, yeah, that's a pretty shallow thinking. But yeah, that, I can see why that would fly. Yeah, they just want you to behave yourself. So I started adopting that. Well, lo and behold, God wasn't going to let me stay there. And he just revealed himself to me. And so I really sensed the call of God. I mean, I, I sensed the call of God on my life. Now, I was in the part of the Catholic Church. wasn't going to church like a lot of Catholics do or don't do. But I remember telling all my friends that it was a bold move for me because they knew me and my lifestyle at that time. I was 19. It was it was, it was the worst of days for me, believe it or not, and um, living that life I was living. But I was telling my friends about this newfound excitement. I didn't even, I knew nothing. I was just starting to read the Bible. I, I, knew, I just knew that God was stirring me and calling me. And so I assumed that I was just going to be a Catholic priest. I mean, I thought this is, what it, this is what all these priests experience. This is what it feels like. This is why those guys... And I'm thinking, oh, I'll have to work one day a week on Sundays. This will be great, right? No, I really thought that. But it was more than that. It wasn't just laziness. I really sensed the call of God. So I'm sitting there explaining it to one of my friends one day, uh, trying to, you know, try and <laughs> take, uh, c communicate this idea of God working in your life. He's doing this huge thing in you. You don't really understand it all anyway, but now trying to communicate that to your friends who have known you as a whole different person. So I'm telling them, yeah, I'm called to be a priest. And one of my friends, he was looking at me, and, he, and I was wearing these pants at the time. I was 19. I was wearing these pants. This is 70s, okay? And they had zippers, all, this, like, like 30 zippers on these pants all down the legs. And I'm sitting here telling them, I, I believe I'm being called to be a priest. 
And he says to me, well, you're going to get rid of those pants. <laughs> so the, he was right, you know. But what happened with me was I didn't answer the call. I'm not saying Catholic priest at that time. I'm saying I, I began to read the Bible. But I didn't get plugged into a body of believers where I could find my call into a church. See, there, even, even the Lone Ranger has Tonto. There aren't any Lone Ranger Christians, right? So I tried to do it on my own, be a Christian on my own. And unfortunately, what happened is I went back into the world a little at a time, a little at a time. I remember one time I was talking to God one day, and I, I, I know how he acts, and he's able to do move people and do... I said, God, you know, all those 17 years, how come you never sent somebody to, to reel me, to get me, you know, to tell me? And I, I wasn't putting it on him. I was just curious, you know, knowing he's God, he could do that. The moment I, those words came out of my mouth, the light went on in my head, and he reminded me of, this, of my upstairs neighbors at the, part, at the apartments I lived at. They, they, they invited me to church. There was this whole, they invited me in the house and opened the Bible, and this whole God thing was happening. I, I, it was one of those God things that happened in their living room, and lo and behold, they invite me to church. Well, I never went. I didn't make time. And uh, they moved away eventually, but the point was God, I, God was saying, I did try to. You chose not to. You weren't answering the call of God, the specific call to become a Christian. Years go by, and the Lord reeled me in 17 years later. I won't go into the details. I don't have time. But, but what happened was, as time went by, I realized, because here's what happened to me. I really thought, since that call I had in 76 was real. It was God. But then when it went away kind of thing, and I did my, I went away, I was thinking, what was that? What was that, what was that about? Was I just delusional at that time? Or was it, did I think it was God? But years went by, and I realized as God brought me into the ministry, and I realized that was real. God was calling me into the ministry. I just wasn't listening. And, um, and it wasn't just the timing. Like I said, these people had invited me to church, and I chose not to go, not to answer the call of God. Taking that next step in the call of God, because it's a commandment of God. It's not a choice. It, here's the, the funny thing about this. It's not a choice. In other words, I believe we're made specifically for a certain purpose. And we won't find our function. We won't, we won't, we won't be content really in life until we, we find and walk in that purpose that God has for us. And you have a specific purpose in the body of Christ. That's my point. You need to find your function in the body of Christ. Answer the call of God on your life because it's, it's a commandment by God. But Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope, to Timothy, that's who the letter is penned to, a true son in the faith. Now, of course, Paul was, was, Timothy was Paul's son in the faith, or Paul being Timothy's father in the faith. And Timothy was a pastor, a very young pastor. And um, he um, answered the call at a, at a young age. He was, had a grandmother and a mom that raised him, uh, godly people. And he answered the call of God. And Paul sent him to a place called Ephesus. He was a pastor at a church in Ephesus. And it was tumultuous what was going on with, with, with Timothy at that time. And going through tough times in the ministry. We're in a spiritual battle. He's a young man. All kinds of things that go on in the, in, in, in the church, in the body there. And Paul is going to write something to Timothy here. And this is point number two regarding the specific call of God. Now, there's the call calling you to be a Christian. There's a call calling you to be whatever your function is in the body of Christ. Now, I want to talk about a specific call, meaning um, how to discern God's will in a situation. Because he says this, the Apostle Paul speaking to Timothy in verses 3 and 4. This is point number 2, the specific call of God. As I urged you, when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus. That's the word that's going to be spoken by the Apostle Paul, spoken to his young protege, Timothy, at a time when Timothy was questioning, where in the world should I be? I think he probably, this is my assessment, 
This is my, that he wanted out of Ephesus. It was, it was, he was on the, he was on the fire, in the frying pan on the fire. There's a lot of false doctrine going on. Don't take for granted when somebody's young, especially, you know, because he told them, he says, don't, don't, don't let them um, despise your youth, right? That's harder for a young person to be in the ministry because you've got a lot of older people that you're ministering to and they don't take you as seriously just because you're younger. So he was battling with that as well. And I believe that Paul gave him something to right the ship and it was a word and it was a word from Paul, but more than that, it was a word from God. And it was this very simple word, remain in Ephesus. Stay there. Stay put. Stay where you are. Bloom where you're planted. That's where God put him. And, and I, can, I can identify with this idea of wanting to get out of Dodge, if you know, if you know what I mean, in the ministry. And um, some of you are laughing. Um, but uh, through the years, um, when things get hard, uh, you know, it, it seems easy. The grass is, you've heard the, the adage, the grass is greener on the other side. Man, you, you know, <laughs> you go through some sheep bites and everything else and all the grasses, you want to you escape. If you can, yeah, this is nice. Let's get out of here. You know what I'm saying? And, um, it, it, but for my wife, God bless her, you know, she's been a, she's been a very, a, 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 she's been a, an anchor many times in our, in, in, uh, in our relationship. And, but more than that, I'm glad that, that the, the Lord gave me a word that I, that for my call. This is very important, this idea of the call. Um, the specific call we're talking about now. And when we came here, it started basically by, a, by the pastor that was over me, you could say, it, it, at the church I was at. He had come here uh, for a pastor's conference in Maryland. They found out that there was no pastor at this particular church. He had resigned. They needed a pastor, and, and on that trip, this pastor, he said, I, I thought of you. You know, your, your face your, came to my mind as I was talking about this with these people that the elders of this church that needed a pastor, I was thinking about you. Um, so I began to pray, Candace and I began to pray, and we prayed about other places because we were at, I was the pastor at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, and there were many people calling there, sending letters there to, that needed pastors all over the nation, all over the world, really. So I prayed and visited some churches even in, in, in San Francisco. Yeah, believe in San Francisco, close to San Francisco. Can you believe that? Um, and then other, you know, we even prayed about a place called Tonga. Look that up, you know. Before the internet, I had to go to the library. That's how long ago. I went to the library and did research on Tonga. And I used to joke with my wife. I said, She's like, Tonga, the, the hot desert. I mean, the hot, uh, I said, yeah, honey, I have this vision of you walking through the jungle, and all of a sudden this big leaf, and you just went, and blew this leaf off yet. And she, I used to tease her with that one. We're going to Tonga, honey. Well, that wasn't what God had. It's what we, we sought him on it. We prayed about it. But when I, so we prayed, I don't know how many times, three or four times before, and then, like I said, the pastor came and told me what he told me after he got back from the trip here in Maryland in 2001, whatever it was, or two, and we began to pray about that. And man, I opened the Bible, and the, and the Lord just kind of flooded me in Isaiah. And, and the scripture finally, there were so many, but this scripture jumped out at me, no longer remember the former things. Behold, I will do a new thing. And the Lord spoke to me and says, your time at Costa Mesa is over. Just like that. Your time at Costa Mesa is over. Now, I want to tell you something. I was loving being there. I was still in the pinch-me state, but I was excited about what God had for the future because the call of God's exciting. The specific call of God is exciting. And so he gave me, and I, I began to put the dates. I still have the Bible that I put the dates in, but I had to revisit that many times later when I started doubting the call. Lord, are you sure? Did I not hear you? I think I was just wanting to hear something from God, and I made this whole thing up in my head. Maybe that was happening, right? You ever done that one? I couldn't have heard that from God, you know, because it's not working out the way that I thought it was going to work out, right? I'd go back to the Bible, and the beautiful thing was, it wasn't just that he reiterated what happened several years beforehand. It was 
whole new and fresh and alive right there, an encouragement like the well. You were getting watered at the well, the word of God. So I understand what it means when you want to get out of Dodge. And believe me, I'm not alone in this. I have, I have counseled many pastors since then that have the same idea because Satan wants you to leave town. That's one of his tactics. Get out of Dodge. That's one of his lines that he uses, that he tries to get you just to leave. Now, this is one of the most asked questions. How do I discern the will of God? And I would say this to you, it's about the process, all right? God's more interested in the process. In other words, like, I need to get from A to B. I want to go from A to B. I just want to get to B from A, okay? God says, no, I, I like the process from A to B. I'm not just getting to B from A. The process is what God's interested in. I'm going to give you an acrostic that... Remember in the Old Testament when God would move the children of Israel? Do you remember that, how he did that? He, in the desert, would be a cloud. Now, that was a welcome cloud because, you know, clouds are good when the sun's hot, right? It shields you from the sun. So God would lead them in a cloud. And the way that it worked, the cloud would, the cloud would stay put. They knew that they were supposed to be right, they were right where they were supposed to be. But when that cloud would start moving, they were to follow the cloud. That's how they did it. It was that simple. Life was simple then, right? Discerning the will of God. You just watch for the cloud, and when the cloud starts to move, you move. Well, I'm going to give you a little an acronym or an acrostic that it will help you to remember some things about discerning the will of God or the specific call of God in your life. And here's what it is. It's based upon that word cloud, C-L-O-U-D. I'm going to do it quickly, okay, because this is a whole message in itself, and I'm just going to give you the points. The first one is the C, and that is the circumstances. God will use your circumstances. The Bible says that he opens doors that no man can close, and he closes doors that no man can open. So God, by a closed door, can direct you, or by an open door, he will direct you. Some of us get all worked up when we get a closed door, like, oh, no, it's the end of... No, when God's closing the door, it's for a reason. He's directing you. Look for the open window, the open door, whatever it would be. But he uses circumstances. But here's what I want to say to you. Note that that is what the world does. The non-believer directs, gets his life directed basically by circumstances. That's how they live all the time. Closed doors, oh, that's it. Here's an opportunity over here. There's an opportunity over there. I'm not praying about stuff. They're just taking, if it seems better, you just go there, right? You just, if it's, you know, you, you, you do the assessment based upon things that are somewhat fleshly, really, and that's the way that the world lives. So we need to be careful. We're looking for God's hand in a circumstance, okay? Not just the circumstance itself, circumstances. Then, and I think one of the most important, the L is the law of the Lord the Bible. This is what I say to people. Have you heard from God in the Word? I want to tell you that, like I said earlier, I could go back to the Word because I'd heard from God in the Word, and I knew my wife bore witness to what I was, what I was hearing in the Word, and, and we knew I could go back to it, and it was reaffirming my call years later. Listen, God wants to speak to you in the Bible, through the Bible. He wants to direct you. He, has a, he wants to direct you specifically in the, situa the, the things in life, the many decisions that you need to make in life. Now, you don't need to seek God's will for, should I go to work tomorrow, right? It's Monday. If you work on Monday, you go to work tomorrow. You have to pray about that, right? Yeah, well, you're on vacation. Well, don't go to work tomorrow then. But you don't have to pray about that either, right? You don't have to pray about, should I go to school today? You know, no, uh, no, it's not hyper-spiritual. Some things you don't need to be praying about, but there are a lot of things that you just kind of do that you should be praying about. But the law of the Lord, looking for God to speak to you through a word in the word, a confirmation from the word. Now, so we got the circumstances, the law of the Lord, the O, Others. Now, 
here's what I would say to you. The Bible says that out of the mouth of two or more witnesses, let every matter be established. So we're talking about confirmation mostly. In other words, God will use other people in your life. This is, a, this is an illustration here where Paul isn't the cult leader and everybody under him must now do what he says, right? That's not what's happening here. But what Timothy would do is Paul tells him, remain in Ephesus. That's a confirmation for him. I'm sure the Lord's already been speaking to him about that. You get the idea? So others, in this case, of course, he would be the father in the faith that God put over Timothy. Very important concept. It would be your parents, your spouse, your, your, the church, your Christian friends. But this is important to keep in mind, to stay balanced. Other people aren't to run your life, make your decisions for you, but they are put there for a safety for you. In other words, other people that are praying people that you know will bear witness to what you're involved in, right? If you're doing something, if you're involved in something, and all the Christian people around you are saying, this is doesn't right. Time to stop and wait on the Lord, right? Don't push past something like that. So God uses the others, C-L-O. And then you, the undisturbed place, okay? This idea of peace that passes understanding. The Bible says that let the peace of God Rule in your hearts. Do you know this? Do you know that God will direct you by his and through his peace? Now, the devil is just the opposite. He moves people by fear, scares them, and, and, and that will move people. That gets people to do things. They're hasty about it, and, and they will... Not, that's not how God does it, though. God does just the opposite. He will give you a peace about a situation, about a circumstance. So seek God's peace in a situation. And the last thing, um, D, the desires of your heart. The Bible says, um, delight yourself in him, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So while you're delighting yourself in the Lord, you're seeking him in the word, you're in communion with him, what will take place is the desires that you have will be his desires. In other words, in this situation, as Timothy began to pray, if he, when he's delighting himself in the Lord, he will not only have a peace about remaining in Ephesus, but he will want to. He will want to. You get what I'm saying? That's his desire. Yeah, I want to be here. I, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. And, you know, I came from, let me tell you something, I came from a very beautiful place as far as the scenery goes. I could look out my window and see the Pacific Ocean. Very nice. I could go play basketball, walk down the Walked down the hill, right to, there was a basketball court about 50 yards, not even 50 yards from the surf. And that's where I played my basketball. Not too shabby as far as I was concerned. And it was all right there in my, in my neighborhood. That was where we last lived. It's a beautiful place. One day, one of the elders from our church, he and his wife were going to Sam Russell. They were going to go to California. So I'm telling them where we lived. And so I get this phone call. And, and he says to me, I can't believe you moved from here to come to New Jersey from this place. And, I, you know, here's what I'm getting at, though. We've never looked back. We've never looked back. We, we, we loved it while we were there. It's gotten a lot crazier, apparently, they're telling me, from when we were there. We're talking 20 years ago now, right? Things have changed everywhere, especially in California. But the scenery's nice. The, the weather's nice and all that stuff. But the point is, we have a peace. We have a desire to be here. We have a desire to be where God's called us to be. And so the circumstances, the law of the Lord, others, undisturbed place, and the desire of your heart, the specific, let's for God's specific calls, 
the situations, the, the guidings, the, the directings. And now we get to verses 5 through 11. And now we come to the purpose of the call. Why? What is God doing? Why is he, why is he, why is he calling us? Um, let me read it to you. In verse 5. Now the purpose of the commandment is love. From a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. What's the purpose of the law? The purpose, I mean, the purpose of the call? The purpose of the call is that the love of God may be manifested to a lost and a dying world. That's it. That's what this is all about. That's the bottom line of what God is doing right now. It's not about my creature comforts. It's not about that. I was teaching in the book of Job. I'm sorry. Yeah, Job. I was teaching in the book of Job. And um, I'm sorry, Jonah. I knew I was wrong about that. Jonah. Right before I came here in 2002, teaching a little Bible study on Wednesday afternoon, studying through the book of Jonah, and was at the end. And, um, and the Lord just smote my heart. Because what happened was, when, when the pastor came to me originally and said, uh, by the way, I was announcing to him, I'm going on vacation, I'm going to Canada with my wife, Banff, Canada, we're going to be gone for three weeks. And he goes, Canada, huh? Do you feel called there? And I said, no. He goes, what about New Jersey? You know, it was, believe me, I can just tell you, Banff, Canada, the Canadian Rockies, and Newark, New Jersey, that's what I thought New Jersey was, okay? Those two were like as far on the spectrum as you could get apart from each other, all right? And that was the beginning of it. And I got to tell you, my first thought, now remember, I came from Maryland, okay? I lived in Maryland till in my late 20s. And I thought my first thought was, when he told me, what about New Jersey? You know what I thought? It's cold there. That's what I thought. My first thought, it's cold there. So that's my thought. I didn't even know, I, you know, I thought the thought, but... I'm studying for the Bible study, and the Lord showed me, you're like Jonah. You didn't care about the people. You were more concerned about your creature comforts. Remember when Jonah, the, the sun was beating down on him. He's over the hill looking down at Nineveh. They've repented, and he's upset. He doesn't care about those people. But then the, he says, then God caused a, a plant to grow over him, and he was shaded. And he's like, ah, now I'm comfortable. And then it says God prepared a worm to eat the plant, right? And then the thing went away. And so Jonah was upset again. But God, what he spoke to me was, you, you were more concerned about your own creature comforts about how cold it was there than about the people. Now, that was true. That was my first thought. That was my flesh. But God began to use that and show me, I'm sending you, it's about my people. That's what you should care about. So the purpose of it was love, the love of God being manifested to a lost in a dying world. See, it's not about your creature comforts. Don't get too comfortable here. This is not your home. You're a foreigner. You're one of these aliens that they talk about. You don't belong here. Then you're not going to stay here for that long. That's the truth. You've been made or remade for heaven. That's where we're headed. But until then, there's a purpose in the call that God has for you, and it's not just to give you a more comfortable life here on earth. It's that the love of God would be manifested to a lost and a dying world. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. I'm going to read it to you. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. In Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. See, folks, what God wants to do 
is he wants to manifest his love through you. Are you willing to answer the call? He wants to bless the world through you. That's the call that you have on your life. That's the call that we have on our lives. Now, I want you to see um, that this love is to first and foremost to build up the church. Yeah, the love that we have for one another. And don't we exercise that? We love one another. And we build each other up in, in the body of Christ. We're not perfect people. None of us are. But we accept, we, we accept one another. And we love one another. Um, but the last thing that he's going to speak about is the law here. Look what he says about the law. Because he's going to, verse 8, he's going to get into this because, verses 8 through 11, because the guys that were teaching the false doctrine were teaching the legalistic side um, of the law, meaning to keep the law. That's what, that's what this is all about. And I want to tell you, the purpose of the call is love, not law. Law has its place. Look what it says in verses 8 through 11. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, Christian, but the lawless and insubordinate, non-Christian, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers, of fathers, murderers, of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers. And if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed, of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Now, when I read that list of the world, listen, this is how I want us to pray. Now, hear me on this. Because we want to fill this, we want to fill every seat in this church. But look at this. We're going to pray that God would fill this place with the ungodly, with sinners, with the unholy, with the profane, with murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, and manslayers, fornicators, sodomites, kidnappers, liars, perjurers. You're saying, Pastor Bill, what are you talking about? Yeah, that's what we want people, we want non-believers in here. This is not a country club. Keep out the fornicators. Don't let the sodomites in. No. We've got ours. We know where we're going. We want to take as many people with us as we can. So here's a list of the people you need to be inviting to church. Don't call them that. But the, the Apostle Paul says, when he mentioned this list in another place, says, as were many of you. We're not, this is not a country club. This is a life-saving station where the good news is presented, the way to life. We want to invite them all, get everybody in here. You know, I was thinking about this idea. I'd love just to... There's, a, there's just a cool thing about the church being full, okay? There's a dynamic that takes place there, right? The, the, the worship team knows this too. It's just the singing dynamic. You got, when you got more of a choir, it's like that room's a lot. This is an awesome room right here. This is a wooden room, and, and um, maybe this is an encouragement to sing louder. But the point is just getting, getting the people in here. And so that's a, that's a cool thing. But even if we could get this place full of Christians, let's say that we, I don't know, we went to another church and started telling, hey, come to our church, you know, come, come to our church. We got softer seats and this and that. Listen to our pastor or whatever else, you know. The, that's not what we're here for. Just to fill our church with Christians. We go from one church to the other. That's not what church is designed for. It was designed to be, the way that it worked is people would go to a place like Ephesus where there, man, that was, Ephesus was a wicked city, Okay. And you'd go in there and you'd preach the gospel and people would start coming to Christ. And then, of course, that was their church, right? That was their church. Don't misinterpret what I'm saying right now, okay? But, but hear what I'm saying at the same time. We want to fill the church with non-believers so they can get saved. That's what we're here for, right? That's what we are here for. And um, to save the lost, because we're going to heaven. 
But if that, if, if, if that was the only thing we were doing, we'd already be there. He would take us. He would take us. So, considering the call of God, the call of God is by the commandment of God. Considering the call of God is a specific call of God. And then the purpose of the call of God. Let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you for your word this morning. And Lord, we've been reminded and encouraged, exhorted, admonished, reminded again what's most important. And Jesus, it's you. And that the world would know you. We're reminded of what the Apostle Paul said when he met you. Who are you, Lord? What would you have me to do? So, Lord, we want to pray first for your church, your bride, whom you've left here for such a time as this to manifest to this world the love of Jesus Christ. Lord, empower us. Fill us to overflowing with your spirit that your love would permeate from every part of our beings, Lord. May we be known as the most loving people in the world because of who you are. But Lord, we also want to pray for anyone here that's not saved, that's not born again. That if they died today, they wouldn't know where they would end up. Lord, we want to pray for anyone here that wants to receive Christ. If that's you today, there's a question mark in your mind. You're not sure of your eternity. Jesus wants you to leave this place and be sure, be assured. But you must take the step. You must answer the call of God. He's calling you into his marvelous light. It's all about your surrender right now. It's about you laying down the life that you've been living. It's about turning your life over to the one who created you and the one who has a plan for you. But it begins with your surrender to him. And he's calling you to that place today. And if you want to surrender to Jesus Christ today, I want to lead you in a prayer. Pray this prayer. Pray it out loud and, and pray it after me. And mean it in your heart. And God will hear you. Pray this prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to come to this planet and die on that cross for my sins. Lord, I'm a sinner. Forgive me for sinning against you. Come into my life today. Jesus, be my Savior, but be my Lord. I want to live that plan that you have for me. And I pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together.